morning. Now, I don't know whether David Dimbleby says this with a straight face or not, but it is true that this morning our politicians have not seen the questions that were put in the ballot box yesterday. I only saw them half an hour ago. Um, but we have, we have a few questions picked to be a spread across the kind of ideas that were both discussed yesterday in the sessions but also um, uh, written down on those postcards by you. Let me introduce our panel uh, 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 one by one. So I'm sure they're familiar to you. Um, Jackie Bailey, who is closest to me here, um, is the Scottish Labour MSP for Dumbarton. Welcome, Jackie. See if I get all this right. Uh, then Patrick Harvey, MSP in Glasgow for the Scottish Greens. Um, in the middle there, I wonder if that's politically speaking, we'll find out, John. John Mason is the SNP MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. And then next to John, welcome uh, to Gordon Lindhurst, who is Scottish Conservative candidate for the 2015 general election here in Edinburgh in Edinburgh South Western. And then last but not least uh, is Willie Rennie, the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats. And if you saw his party's political broadcast for the European elections, you will have seen him strolling down Dunfermline High Street um, uh, talking about the European elections. But anyway, enough of that. Please welcome all of our MSPs and candidates. Thank you. So, uh, I need to get my notes for this part to do it accurately, no problem. Uh, our first question this morning is coming from Chris Baird. Where's Chris? Thank you, Chris. The microphone is just going to come to you. And we'll take the first question. Thank you. Do the panel agree that rather than blaming people living in poverty, as is happening with many politicians and in mainstream media, we should be addressing and challenging the underlying causes of poverty in society? Thank you, Chris. So just to repeat, um, do the panel agree that rather than blaming people living in poverty, as is happening with many politicians and mainstream media, we should be addressing and challenging the underlying causes of poverty in society? So we're keen to hear your views really on stigma, but also on what you see as the underlying causes of poverty in Scotland today and in the future. So... Let's just start in the order we introduced you. Let's go with Jackie first. Um, can I agree with the proposition that lies behind the question? Um, it, you know, throughout my working life, I have worked in a number of communities across Scotland um, actually trying to tackle poverty and giving communities um, the tools and, and you know, the measures they seek themselves to try and escape from poverty. The one thing I am absolutely clear about is nobody you know, wants to live in poverty. It is not a lifestyle choice that people make. It is circumstances in which they find themselves. And very much from my perspective, the two things we need to do is one, um, I do believe that work is one of the best routes out of poverty, but currently work isn't paying. And we're finding lots of people experiencing in-work poverty that frankly is a disgrace. But the second element is that there will be times, the nature of the economy is such, that people aren't always in continuous employment. People's skills change, they sometimes will go in and out of employment and in and out of poverty, and our system isn't currently designed to you know, support them effectively at those points where um, they, they are unable to work, and more generally, to support people who can't work, um, because it's about how we carry ourselves as a society and what dignity um, we afford to people. Thank you. Patrick? Uh, you probably all know that the way this works is that politicians uh, spend their lives getting good at giving you the answers they think you want to hear. And probably everybody on this panel is going to say, yes, we agree with the, the premise of the question. I think it's really important to compare the answers that you hear with the track record, with what people have actually done when they've had influence or power. Because the stigmatisation, the victim blaming, the, the blaming of, of people in poverty for their poverty, there are really hard, nasty, bigoted examples, like some of the, the mainstream media, the Benefit Street, like some of the, the newspapers as well. There are softer examples as well. I want to mention the phrase, hard-working families. How often have we heard the phrase, hard-working families, from politicians of a number of stripes? Hard-working families is a phrase that's designed to say, we're on your side, against your neighbour. 
It's a design to divide people against one another. And there are policies as well, not just the rhetoric, but the policies. I think we've ended up with a benefit system which is designed to hound people into work. Even whether it's humiliating low-paid work, uh, work can be a good route out of poverty. Can be. It's not the only good route out of poverty. And there's also a great deal of really necessary vital work that people are doing which isn't paid at all. Caring work. Work in their community. So I think we need to recognise quite how bad the, this problem has got. The, the empathy that a welfare state depends on, the human empathy that a welfare state depends on, has been relentlessly attacked for decades. It's been all but broken. We need to win from first principles again the argument for a welfare state, for what a, a welfare state is all about, which is people looking after one another rather than people judging one another. Mr. Patrick. So, John, there was a good challenge there from Patrick that uh, we should judge on actions, not just words, not just rhetoric. So, how do you respond to Chris's question? Well, if, you, if you want, Chris wanted a one word answer, it would be yes, in that uh, we should not be going around blaming people and we should be addressing the problems. And, you know, I suppose to be fair, uh, there have been good things have come out of all sorts of governments in the past, both at Westminster and at Holyrood. And, and I don't think going back and, you know, blaming one uh, more than another, which we can all do, uh, is the right answer. So I think some of the things we need to address, and, and I've just chosen three to mention, uh, one would be uh, wages. Uh, I think the living wage is a good thing as an interim step, but it, it cannot be the final answer. It's got to be raising the statutory minimum wage uh, to the same level eventually uh, as a living uh, wage. Uh, secondly, I would say housing. Uh, I, I see in my own constituency the huge difference it makes if somebody's in a really good uh, flat house uh, run by a uh, housing association, RSL, eh, rather than in some scruffy private rented sector eh, kind of place. Um, so housing definitely. And then thirdly, benefits. I mean, as, as Patrick's correctly said, we need to rethink the welfare system. Eh, and that has to include that there's got to be a minimum that people need to live on. And once they're on that minimum, you cannot go below that, whatever you do. Eh, I mean, it seems to me that I was in one of the prisons recently um, you know, prisoners get a certain minimum, and that should apply to absolutely everybody. And, and the conditionality and the sanctions that are going on just now are just not acceptable. Thanks, John. <clears throat> Gordon. Well, I'm not going to disagree with your question, uh, in spite of what's been said about politicians just agreeing with whatever people ask or assume in the question. Um, I think one of the issues in this country that has not been addressed and which we see in other European countries more is we have too much emphasis, I think, on education, not just work being a route out of, property, of poverty, but higher education in terms of university qualification, that being a route out of poverty and so forth. I think people who are not in academically qualified trades, skills, or jobs should be rated as being important as those of us who do jobs that require an academic qualification. And if you look to the continent and other European countries, you can see that in their um, educational systems, much more emphasis is placed on the practical skills, which uh, may or may not be the sort of things that people from particular backgrounds relate to, but there is more of an emphasis on a broad range of skills being valued by society and by governments. To come back to um, two points, uh, what has, for example, the Conservative government done, because uh, I'm here as the Conservative representative, so I think you want specific examples. I would agree with John that no government gets everything right. Uh, there have been good and bad in previous governments of different complexions. But two things the present government has done is, uh, one is cutting income tax for the lowest paid. And uh, the second is raising the minimum wage, which is one of the things uh, John has mentioned, and raising it above the rate of inflation. So those are two practical things that have been done. Okay, thank you. And last word on this first question to Willie. Who I mean, may Gordon just Drake. take credit Sorry, for that last point, I don't know, but let's see. Yeah, no, 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 I, um, I agree with Gordon that the last two 
measures that he's highlighted by the government about the tax thresholds and about the minimum wage are, are good things and something we've advocated. I think the, the, the questioner is right. We often do um, look to blame rather than look for the core reasons. And the core reasons are often wide and varied. It's, you know, to characterise everybody as having the same problems is not the case. Um, there are a variety of different issues that we need to address. Mental health is a significant area that we do need to invest considerable more in, considerable amount more in, so to give people the ability um, to work. And in some ways, I, I disagree with Patrick to a certain extent um, when he says that um, work is not the only route. Work is a major part of people's dignity and contribution back to society, and it's something that we should recognise as something that is of value. Now, I'm sure, I know that Patrick didn't dismiss it as having no value, but it's worth emphasising that it has considerable value. Education is another key <coughs> aspect of this. Education, particularly in the early years um, for young children, the work that Harry Burns has done has highlighted the need for community cohesion, of good education at the right times in the right communities. And those are the areas that we should be exploring, because I think through that, through the innate ability of of um, exploiting the, the innate ability of people, then I think we can tackle many of the problems that we're facing in poverty. Thank you very, very much. I'm going to come back to Chris just to respond briefly to what you've heard, Chris, and then yeah. take a couple of other comments. Okay. I'd just like to say that uh, Patrick's answer was the most that uh, resonated with me, but uh, like he said, hard-working families, it's quite ironic that this comes from politicians who aren't exactly known for their industriousness. Um, and I think this language is quite divisive. We've had a torrent of lies and disinformation, which has been fed by, I believe, politicians to the media. Um, and we can see that there is a complete lack of empathy for people uh, living in poverty or non-benefits. And the GRF done a report which shows that the general public are starting to believe this, that people are... Um, in poverty because of personal failings of laz laziness and lack of willpower. And I think there has to be a national campaign to challenge these um, stigma and demonisation of uh, people in benefits and disabled people in particular. And I don't think it's any surprise that we can see a rise in disability hate crime because of this that's happening. And if this was happening to any other group in society, there would be absolute uproar, and rightly so. And the fact that it isn't shows you how far down the political agenda we really are. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's time for maybe a, it's time for maybe a couple of brief comments, not questions, but brief comments on anything you've heard in this first round of responses. Anyone want to come in or we can move straight to our second question? Well, actually, I'll give each of you one chance to come back briefly uh, per question, not for each question. So Patrick's turn this time. Thanks very much. Um, notwithstanding the question about whether or not we work hard, I think we politicians often don't work in the interests of the common good. I think that's the, the most important point. The, the question about work, uh, and Willie Rennie uh, raises this, work can be uh, a really important source of dignity for people, a really important source of uh, actually human relationships and, and connecting people to a wider community. Or it can be the exact opposite. If you're on a zero hours contract, a minimum wage, or if your employer doesn't recognize the need for you to balance your work and your family commitments, if the kind of work that you're doing is stressful, humiliating, unsafe, uh, and not compatible with yeah. your, your human capital, your social capital, then it can actually leave people stuck in poverty or even push them even further even deeper into poverty. So we need to recognize that work is a, it's a natural human instinct. Very, very few people want to spend, want, choose to spend their time doing nothing okay. for their lives. Most people want dignified, interesting, rewarding work. And that doesn't always mean financially rewarding. It means a, a whole range of different things. But the way work is remunerated in society, the way we are incentivized to work is wrong at the moment. And it, it very often, leaves the, the, the wealthiest people in the world being given incentives to work harder by giving them even more money, and the poorest people in the society being given incentives to work harder by giving them less money. Okay. Uh, I, I'm feeling generous, so here's a hint. We may be coming back to this theme uh, shortly. But before we do that, uh, second question is from Sarah Beatty smith Sarah's in the middle here. That microphone's coming to you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, we're all here, I think, for lots of different reasons. We're all in, involved in tackling poverty in different ways. Um, from my perspective, I'm involved in tackling fuel poverty, for one. Um, but I'd like to ask the panel whether you think that dividing poverty into different sections like fuel poverty or food poverty is actually helpful in how we tackle it, or is it actually just different sides of the same coin? Are we actually just talking about poverty throughout here? What do you think is most helpful for tackling it? So, um, is it helpful to talk about fuel poverty and food poverty, for example, separately? Uh, are all they all simply consequences of people living in poverty? Um, let's come to Willie first this time. I actually do think it's, it's helpful to separate it, because then we can bore down into the real reasons as to why that particular aspect is happening, why that is a particular burden um, on individuals. So to divide it, it is helpful. Of course, it's all down to the fact that people don't have enough money to be able to survive in the conditions that we would like everybody to survive in. Um, so um, it does come down to the same point, but I actually think it is helpful to fully understand. I mean, many health conditions these days, you know, we know much more about them because we're able through research to understand fully what the, the consequences are and the, and the, the root reasons um, for those conditions. You know, I, it's all about all health, but it's better to understand the real reasons behind it. So I think it is useful to divide it in the way that you describe. Okay, why don't we just come along the panel in the opposite order, Gordon. Okay. Um, I think there, there's some point in saying that looking at it, there's underlying causes or situations or circumstances that people find themselves in. So dividing it up into different aspects is not always helpful, generally speaking. But I think, as Willie has said, if you're going to address specific issues, you have to break down into the detail of those specific issues. So, for example, in fuel poverty, what the government has done, one measure is bringing in the fuel energy bill to require fuel companies, energy companies, to provide their customers with the lowest tariff available because we all know the sort of complexities of billing and the range of things that people get. And that is one specific measure to ensure that people pay the least that they can or have to for their energy. And uh, to come back to the working families point, of course working families are a very good idea and we should support them. I don't think we should single out individual types of people for uh, categorization in the way that Patrick has done. That does not mean, of course, that there are not others who are very hardworking, unwaged people, including in the voluntary sector, who do things that are absolutely essential to our society, our communities, and the good and future of our nation. Thank you. John? Um, I mean, yes, it is all part of the, the one problem or different sides of the one coin or however you want to put it. Um, and so we sh what we shouldn't do is divide things up into two neat compartments, which I suppose people like myself as an accountant have a tendency to do. Uh, and they kind of have a silo mentality, which is, is clearly wrong. But I think it does help you tackle all sorts of problems if we look at specific areas. And, I mean, if you take housing associations, which I'm a fan of and used to work in, um, I mean, part of me feels, well, it's really good that they concentrate just on the housing side and get the houses sorted, because that is a huge problem in itself. And yet, at the same time, I think it's really good that housing associations have been going into wider action, or whatever it's currently called, and because clearly you cannot look at housing just on its own. It does affect uh, people's benefits, people's wages, uh, fuel poverty, and all of these kind of things. And I suppose one example where I see things a bit, a bit more joined up is in the Commonwealth Games Village in my own constituency, where you've got really high quality houses. Uh, so you've got the housing element, but very much tied in with the fuel poverty side because there's going to be a district heating system. Uh, the, the insulation is fabulous in these houses. Uh, so you, you're going to get, uh, hopefully, the people that move in them don't just get a good house, but do it, uh, have a, a cheaper level of fuel as well. Patrick, like, like John, you represent Glasgow. I was struck by a recent conversation in Glasgow where housing associations were gathered together with some energy companies. And uh, the discussion there was, um, despite record investment in housing, improving the housing stock in Glasgow over the last 20 years, um, we see rising fuel poverty again. And the estimate was that if fuel prices had only risen with inflation in the last decade, 
we would probably have fuel poverty at about 5% rather than over 30%. So this is also, isn't it, about the, the energy markets and, and it's possible, it appears to be possible that all the good we're doing with the housing stock can be undone by pricing and market drivers. Yeah, I mean, the, the investment that you were talking about in the, in the housing stock, let's be honest, it was, it was starting with you know, housing stock at a pretty low base, yeah. you know, so we still have very inefficient housing, old stuff and some of the new stuff. There are good examples of new build, but we're also building really shoddy new build as well in this country at the moment. Um, so, yeah, my, my view is that we do need to, to transform the, the way that we allow free market economics to dictate <coughs> essential utilities like energy and I think uh, a much more collaborative approach where far more communities are generating some of their own energy where ownership is not controlled by a handful of multinationals We're transforming our energy away from fossil fuel toward much higher renewables in Scotland that should be taken as an opportunity to transform ownership as well having some publicly owned and some community owned as well as locally privately owned by individual householders and small businesses so that we, we have a much more diverse energy system. I, I do personally take the view that we're moving away from the energy, the, the era of cheap energy. And I don't think that more or less any energy policy is going to recapture cheap unit prices. But we can certainly save a great deal of money by not heating uh, the, the air that's going out of our windows and doors and through our roofs and walls. On the, on the wider point, though, do we segment the issue of poverty? I think we need both approaches. Uh, issues around fuel poverty need to be understood in their own context. Issues that we need to understand how uh, children are affected by poverty and how pensioners are affected by poverty, they're very different. Uh, issues around how it connects to disability, how it connects to health, a whole host of these issues. But at the same time, at the same time, we need economic policy which is recognising the structural causes of poverty and inequality in our society. Economic policy and, and poverty policy must be part of the same mix. Poverty policy can't, anti-poverty policy can't simply be seen as ameliorating the problems caused by our economic system. Uh, and so we, we've, for decades, we've, we've had a, you know, government after government running economic policy that's geared towards growing the overall size of the economy, not geared to making sure that everyone gets a fair slice of the action. Thank you. And Jack, I know that um, fuel poverty is something you've spoken a lot about. You're involved with Energy Action Scotland. What's your response to what you've heard so far? And also this point about food poverty that was raised too. Yeah. I mean, I think the problem is complex. It's interrelated. Um, I don't think you can simply just lump it together and come up with one solution. Although where Patrick is right, the lack of disposable income underpins all of it and cuts across people experiencing different types of poverty. Um, when I look at fuel poverty, I, I, I frankly think it is a national scandal. We have 900,000 households. I think even more recently, um, Energy Action Scotland estimated in the UK Energy Monitor that it had risen to a million households in Scotland experiencing fuel poverty. Now, we have a commitment to end fuel poverty by 2016, you know, and try as we might, if we continue the way we're doing, that just isn't going to happen, and that's a tragedy for the people who are experiencing it. But we know it's, it's controlled by three things, income, price um, of the fuel, and actually energy efficiency measures. And we need to take action on all three. It therefore genuinely depresses me that some of the really exciting things that were done in housing, making houses energy efficient, um, that housing associations, frankly, were at the lead in, just now aren't being done because the money isn't being given out um, at a sufficient level in terms of grant funding. The housing budget has been slashed. That's one of the consequences of it. You don't get the kind of really good creative wins in energy efficiency that we've seen in the past. Um, we also recognise that fuel poverty isn't just about income. If you look at rural areas, some of our rural housing stock is really challenging it will cost more money to make that energy efficient. So instead of doing the huge programs, valuable though they may be, actually, if we're going to solve this, we need to get in around the, the rural housing stock. And finally, um, we've committed to freezing 
energy bills whilst we reform the market, because the real prize is in reforming the wholesale costs, where the energy companies just buy and sell to each other um, and add the price on, and we're the ones ending up picking that up. So frankly, you know, it, poverty is a scandal, but fuel poverty at a million households in Scotland is a national scandal, and frankly, we're not doing enough to tackle it. So thank you very much. I'm going to come back to Sarah, if you'd like to respond to what you've heard. There are subtly different views there, but what, what do you make of what you've heard? Sure, so I think it's really interesting to, to hear what the panel have to say. Um, I think Patrick's point about it being um, the structure of our economy and um, I, th I think economic approaches to poverty is, is a really important one. Um, Jackie also picks up some really important points about um, the different causes of fuel poverty and therefore it being quite useful to talk about fuel poverty as a distinct thing because it's got these different causes. Um, but I do think that sometimes just talking about fuel poverty in Scotland with the power that the Scottish Parliament has, which is really around energy efficiency and perhaps not that much else, um, means that you lose the focus on looking at the income part of the equation. And in Scotland, sometimes we can lose the focus on looking at reforming the whole market and the way that the market works for people. And it makes, I think, politicians in Scotland feel particularly powerless um, to actually tackle any of these issues um, and the relationship that we have with the Westminster Parliament and the, um, I suppose, the incentives with the current coalition government to actually address these issues as well maybe isn't there. So the energy bill that's just gone through um, is, is not really tackling fuel poverty at all and you can see that fuel poverty measures in England have completely fallen away. Um, I mean, they, they have nothing like the fuel poverty measures that we currently have in Scotland. Um, and I think that is an indictment of the, the current um, energy bill at Westminster, actually. I think there's huge problems there. Um, so I, I do think there's, there's different problems about the current setup that we have and how we think about poverty in Scotland. But I think sometimes compartmentalising it means that we can't look at things like low income. We can't look at living wage, for example, as a means to tackle it. And we can't all... Um, I suppose unite around something like a, a new housing strategy for Scotland that would fix a lot of different types of poverty. Thank you very much. Now, again, time for a couple of... <laughs> a couple of very, very quick comments over here. So, uh, it's Marion, isn't it, table 11? And then, gentleman behind. Thank you. Um, yeah, my comment was around welfare reform and... Um, one Parent Families Scotland recently had a Freedom of Information Act um, request answered which showed that around about 9,000 lone parents in Scotland have had their benefit cut um, through sanctions. Um, so when you look at um, where the sanctions are as well, they're in the poorest areas. So you're looking at, you know, Shettleston and Glasgow, Drum, Drum Chapel and, um, you know, areas where there's already high levels of poverty. Um, and I suppose I wanted to sort of in a way, squeeze in a, a question and ask, um, you know, do the panel believe that conditionality around benefits <coughs> entitlement needs to be based on financial penalties and uh, through sanctions, or is there another way? Tell, tell us who you are as well, please. Sorry? T tell us who you are. Oh, sorry, Mary and uh, One Parent Family Scotland. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to put the question to the panel, but we're going to tie it into the next question, which you've anticipated nicely. And then, final comment just here. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's some, some uh, questions need big answers. And having uh, worked in, for Scottish Power for 27 years, I realised I was in a nationalised industry and then I was in a privatised industry and I knew exactly what had happened. The head of Scottish Power uh, at a meeting that I was at uh, announced that his salary was a million and a half. And also, the head of the National Grid, when it was nationalised, was on about 120,000. So they split the energy in industry into 14 and paid every one of them a million and a half. And that is the market. That is the problem. To get rid of the market is the answer because there is no solution in allowing the market to dominate our lives. Or else there's no explanation of why in a whole decade or a period of free enterprise and markets, we have reached the stage where the richer are richer and the poorer are poorer. 
There has to be that. I, I wake up in the morning and that's the answer that comes straight to my head every day. And that's the problem. And we need the unity or purpose to challenge that kind of concept. Because we were asked a question, we'll finish on that, yesterday. What kind of Scotland w would it look like if we didn't have poverty? And I had to say, <coughs> how tough to be socialism. Because there is no other an answer. And we are, and I am in, in favour of battling on every issue and tackling every issue. But somehow we've got to get a political consensus that defeats the neoliberal agenda. And we are the people in this room that can play a key part in challenging that whole notion and not just accepting that this is the only game in town to tinker with the system. We need real prompt, uh, solutions. And that's why I'm saying I, big answers. And just, just to remind us your Sorry, name. Sorry, Willie Black, uh, North Edinburgh Fights Back. Thank you very much. Now, I, I don't have time to take... I don't have time. To, I'll come back to you shortly, Neil, I promise you. Um, on, on this round, Jackie has indicated she'd like to come back in. So you have one bonus go, if you like, per question. <laughs> and uh, this, So you have one, one life to use. Uh, Jackie. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I, I think Willie's right, the market's broken. We're seeing that with fuel poverty, we're seeing that with the rise in prices, that bear absolutely no relation to what's going on um, you know, across, across the world in terms of, of fuel costs. But, but I do absolutely reject Sarah's notion that somehow it's somebody else's fault, because when we passed the legislation in 2016, we were very clear that we wanted to end fuel poverty. We weren't hiding behind excuses of, well, maybe that's somebody else's responsibility. We were determined because it was a matter of political will, not a matter of the Constitution. And let me offer you some very quick suggestions as to very, what we could very, do now. Very, very, very quick. The procurement bill is going through Parliament. Why doesn't that have the living wage in it? That would make a difference to 400,000 workers across Scotland and instantly start to pay them decent wages instead of poverty wages. That's something we could do. We could increase the housing budget it and actually put money back into housing associations where they will use it effectively. Um, what I can't forgive is that the Scottish Government budget of 70 odd million pounds for fuel poverty is underspent in the face of a national scandal. Okay, thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be some kind of responses to that coming along shortly. However, let's move to our third question and this is from Frank Toner. Where's Frank? Hello, Frank. The microphone's just, just coming to you now. I'd like to ask the panel, why does it take longer to receive benefit after registering for work today than it did 30 years ago, given today that everything is electronically processed? So, Just to repeat Frank's question, why, does, why do you think it takes longer to receive benefits after registering for work today than it did 30 years ago, given that everything is processed, processed electronically? Should we come to John first on this one? What's going on with our benefit system, John? It's, it's being driven by a budget and by cuts. And a, from what I can see, both on the outside and speaking to people who work uh, in the DWP and Job Centre Plus, um, they have targets uh, to get people off benefits or not get people on benefits. So it's nothing about the ability. I mean, I actually happen to think the IT system is probably struggling anyway. Um, and clearly, that's been a problem with the, uh, some of the future plans, uh, universal credit and so on. But uh, I, I just think that it, the system is not there to help people. The system is there to keep the costs down. And uh, that is affecting a whole range of things, uh, certainly including sanctions and uh, also at the beginning of the system. So if we're also thinking of what is the longer term, I mean, in the short term, whether we get independence or not, we have to work with the present system and try and make it a bit better, like abolishing bedroom tax. But in the medium to longer term, we really need a whole different culture. We need a whole different thinking. That the benefit system is there to help all of us, uh, we're all going to hit bad times in our lives, whether we lose our job or we have ill health or whatever it is. Yep. Uh, and that system is, should be, it belongs to us. It doesn't belong to the state. It belongs to us as citizens. Uh, and it's there for the good of everybody. And it's there to serve everybody. 
And, and I mean, it's certainly true that if we, if we do have a no vote and we're getting one more power, I would want the power over uh, welfare and benefits uh, to be coming here, because I think we could have a much more joined up system. Uh, and I think there's probably political commitment amongst most of the parties at Holyrood to try and make the present budget work better. And I mean, just on that point, uh, if we put more money into housing, as I would love to see, and as Jackie suggests, the money has to come from somewhere else. So it's all very well saying, let's have more money for X, but where does it come from? Thank you. Gordon, can I come to you next? So um, we've heard about uh, the time you have to wait to receive an income when you register for work. And we heard from Marion about the increasing use of benefit sanctions, which can leave people with no source of legitimate income for periods of time. Um, is this part of the vision for, for um, you know, pushing people towards work? Is it about any job will do? Or are we also interested in people getting into you know, better jobs and staying there? What, what, what do you see as the, that, the purpose of the benefit system, especially for people who are seeking work? Well, the benefit system, I would l look at it the way I think uh, Winston Churchill did. He said the state should provide a ladder that all should climb, but a net, a safety net that no one should fall through. And that's what I would think of when I look at what the purpose of the benefit system is in this country or should be. Uh, the question about the computers and so forth, I remember when I started my job about many years ago, over 10 years ago, I'm not going to admit how long ago it was, but it was very simple. It was pre-email, pre-computer. You got bundles of papers in hard copy, as it's now known. You read it, you did the work, you sent it off to the person by Royal Mail. Now everything's email computers, and uh, it certainly has not speeded things up. So I don't, uh, it may be a general problem, not just a problem for the DWP. Um, but one of the things that I would say needs to be done is the benefit system needs to be simplified. And that, that is the point of the universal credit. Not, not necessarily a perfect system by any means, just like anything when it's first introduced. But the idea is to simplify so that there's not this complex system that people have to go through to try and get benefits. So that's, that's one thing. The bedroom tax, as John has called it, uh, I don't agree it should be abolished. The point is not about pushing people into work. The point is about creating the opportunities for people to work and encouraging them into work <clears throat> and providing them through, for example, the work the, the help to work scheme with additional assistance to help them try to get into work where they're able to work. If they're not able to work, then we are responsible for them as a society to support and look after them. But we have to look at things sensibly. Governments have to look at budgets and so forth. And if people who own their own homes, who've been in employment, saved up money, own their own home, when it comes to the point of health care, they have to sell their home to help pay for their health care in old age, have to give up their home, then if we are all in this together, then equally we have to look at the way people who live in council housing and other forms of housing also are treated, because we are all in this together, and it's not simply the case that one sector of society should benefit. We have to look at how do we fairly assess and revalue things and make things better for everyone. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Willie, I'm gonna to come to you next. And, and I also say that we were hearing yesterday that um, the Department for Work and Pensions published their Scotland analysis paper last week. Uh, that was you know, legitimately for the UK government, making the case for the union, making the case for the current benefit system. What got quite a lot of coverage was the Secretary of State's comment that the current system is a fantastic settlement for Scotland. And I wonder if there's a chink of light, maybe a wee chink of light, between uh, you and your party in Scotland and some of your colleagues in the coalition. Can I be naughty and ask you that too? That's, <laughs> that's very naughty, Jim. <laughs> um, but I don't think we should... I mean, I know people in this room generally don't like welfare reform. There's bits of that I don't like. I mean, I think, for what it's worth, Gordon, that the bedroom tax is finished and it should go. Um, but to claim that it's been dismantled, as I know some people in this panel will claim, and to claim that it's not there to help people, 
I think he is exaggerating what is happening. The welfare budget is still a significant budget. It's actually grown, and I know that the entitlements have changed, but it has grown. And we should recognise, therefore, that it is still a significant safety net in the United Kingdom. I actually think universal credit, once it's fully implemented, and once it's going to be tricky, and that's why it's been phased very carefully, but once it's in place, it'll actually help people considerably. Because if you have one source of payment, so you have that transition between work and unemployment and back again, which simplifies the process, makes it easier for people, cuts down the red tape involved, I think that will be a significant advantage. Of course, it's got its problems, but that doesn't mean everything it's got a problem we should we should uh, avoid implementing. These things are challenging and therefore we need to step up and do it. Um, but of course there is a difference between ourselves and um, some of our Conservative colleagues, certainly on the rhetoric. I mean, we don't embrace any of the rhetoric um, that some have used, and I know Gordon doesn't use that, but others have. But the, the system, the change we're trying to make to the welfare system, um, I think in the end will work out um, to the benefit um, of people who need the support um, at difficult times. And does that extend to Marion's point about a doubling of sanctions in the last two or three years? Is that part of the I mean, sanctions have always Sanctions have always been there, and I know there are some difficulties with the implementation of the process just now. Um, some of it is um, very strict, um, and I know that some of my colleagues are looking at this area to make sure it's been done fairly. You know, the, whenever you're doing a change, it can be difficult at times, and we need to make sure we implement it sensitively. And I don't, I hope, I mean, I know that Susan, for instance, does tell me very directly when things are going wrong, and we feed it back, as we've done with the bedroom tax issue, and we try and get changes. But it doesn't mean, because some things are not working, you should abandon everything. OK. And thank you for taking my supplementary on as well, Alex. Let's come to Jackie next. Can I start at the, the point about sanctions? Because I don't think increasing conditionality actually works. If you want to simplify the system and then you increase the conditionality, it's a perverse incentive in there. And I just simply observe that the number of people being sanctioned, the highest percentage, as far as I'm aware, from an Inclusion Scotland report, if I'm right, um, is actually people with learning disabilities and mental health problems. That, if nothing else, should tell us that the system isn't functioning um, properly. Can I say to Frank, I think it's an a really interesting question. I find it extraordinary in the day of, of new technology when we're even now going to have to apply online that somehow the system can't be speeded up. But it applies not just to the DWP. When I look at people's experience of getting um, discretionary housing payments to alleviate the bedroom tax or applying to the Scottish Welfare Fund, we see similar problems there. And increasingly, where I've seen it work, in my own local authority in Western Berkshire, um, they were very proactive. They knew the people that would fall foul, if you like, of the bedroom tax, who would struggle with it. They went out with application forms. They got them filled in. They were processed immediately. And the fear of eviction or debt increases just went. And I think we increasingly should be doing some of that. Um, can I disagree, as politely as I can, that we aren't all in this together? I only need to look at my constituents, <laughs> you know, people not just out of work, but people in work struggling to make ends meet in the worst cost of living crisis that I think many of us have seen for decades. And then I look, not even down at London, I look across here in this city um, at, at those who are perhaps bankers or the very highest paid, enjoying some of the stratospheric salaries that Willie described earlier. Um, that isn't us all being in it together. Um, and I do think we need to do far more to ensure that the safety net that is the welfare state is there to protect people. Thank you. I'll come back to you in one second. Frank, I just want to give uh, Patrick the final word in answering your question first, Frank. Uh, Welly seemed to imply that some of us might take a, a very extreme position in describing the the current coalition's uh, approach to welfare. Let me take that as an invitation. <laughs> because I, I don't think it's, it's just those of us who are in political parties opposed to the coalition who would not recognise for a moment the description that Gordon or Willie gave of the, the situation that's happening at the moment. I doubt there's anybody in this room, I doubt there's anybody who accesses the, the benefit system on a daily basis. I doubt there's anybody working in the benefit system who would recognise the description 
that we had. And, and a lot of the people working in that system hate what's being done and are themselves working in stressful environments and, and want to be providing a service that gives people the dignity that we all are entitled to. The, there are issues around complexity that are part of this. And there's a, there is a case for simplifying the system. Actually, quite often, the complexity of our welfare system is one of the sources of stress and humiliation for the people uh, who are, are dependent on, on benefits. But to, to uh, try and achieve simplicity at the same time as cutting the income that people have massively through something like the bedroom tax. And it, you know, if, if you're seeing your, your benefits cut because of something like the bedroom tax, it's really very little comfort to hear uh, that the overall bill for government is not going down by the same amount as your income is going down. That doesn't give you a lot of comfort. If the government wanted to get something like the housing benefit bill under control, and it hadn't spiralled out of control, but it had increased significantly over years, the way to do that is to do something about rental prices in the private rented sector. That's going to reduce the housing benefit bill, not at the expense of tenants who've got no other housing available to them, owner occupation unaffordable, social housing unavailable. It, it would do it at the expense of exploitative landlords in some pockets of the country where rents have gone, uh, uh, become silly money. Uh, the, the, my the my argument for simplicity would be a citizen's income, one which is unconditional, one which allows people to get a better balance of the paid work, the unpaid work, the education, the, the, the human relationships, the other aspects of their lives, uh, and gives people uh, the confidence that they, if they start earning a bit, they're not going to have that clawed back. Uh, but it does so in a, in a way that's principally about human well-being, not about bullying and chevying people into work. I just want to add one last cheap point, wee cheap shot at the end here, which is that I, I am aware of, of one family uh, who are dependent on benefits. Uh, they're massively under-occupying uh, their social housing, uh, and yet the government has decided by passing the Sovereign Grant Act that it's going to massively increase uh, what we're all paying uh, for the Windsors and their lifestyle. So let's, let's recognise that we're, we're seeing a government that is not doing this out of necessity. It's prepared to spend money on things that it does think are important. OK, the Windsors, that was a cheap shot. But the, the vast amount of money that's being spent on the military budget, on, on renewing something like Trident, it's willing to spend, things, spend okay. money on things that it does think are important but it's not willing to spend, things, spend money on things that you and I think are important. And Pantikam, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking let's get one referendum out of the way before we get to uh, your, your, your other point. Anyway, um, let's come to Frank just to respond on what you've heard. Yeah. There's, there's a microphone just there now. Great. Why were you saying that uh, the money must come from somewhere? I think we must look at this is the sixth most richest country in the world. We can't afford to supply a poor with a decent, a decent level of income, a decent living. We're all in it together. I'm afraid not. One of your colleagues just recently defrauded the taxpayer of something <coughs> like £45,000. She wasn't called to account for that. She said it was a mistake. Now, if I made a false claim for benefit, I would be in court and very quickly in jail. I'm part of the benefit system at the moment. Uh, I, I, I go into the benefits office, I go and see a works advisor, then I'm sent to Inges. They have target boards. On the walls, plain for everybody to see who's been sanctioned, what their target was for that week, have they, have they surpassed their target, have they done well this week? And I would suggest that maybe we're not all in it together. Maybe there are those and such of those who do better off. I don't understand why people who have money seem to reckon that some people must be poor for them to be doing well. Thanks. Okay.
Thank you, Frank. Uh, I'm going to take two really brief comments. So Nell had her hand up in the last session. So even if it's not on this, Nell, we want to hear from you. And then I'm coming to Susan. If you can be really brief, though, thank you. And then what for an Invercloud elderly forum? I would like to go back to the first question because nobody has mentioned what, what I consider is something very serious. Fuel poverty to me uh, is only two words, but fuel poverty, nobody talks about the effects of fuel poverty and what it does to the older people who are living on a very restricted income. Somebody had the cheek to say, tell them to wear woolly bonnets and extra clothes on, extra cardigans and everything in the house when they've got their, when they can't afford to put, it, put the fire on or the, the light. But what they forget is when people get a bit older, we're also a bit frailer. And I couldn't stay in the house if I couldn't put my light on or my heating on because I would either fall or something like that could happen to all the senior citizens. I think it's an absolute disgrace that these people who run the, run the, the coke gas and electricity places are going to walk in, laughing all the way to the bank, as far as I would say, and people at the very bottom rung of the ladder, like pensioners, not only just pensioners, people who are on a very restricted income have got to watch what they're doing. When you get a bit older, you get a bit frailer. Instead of having to cut your electricity and your heat, you should be able to put more on because that's when you need more. And why is it that all, it's always the older person at the end of the day who gets penalised for all their fancy talk? But to, to that's what I say. It's, it's, it's disgusting. And I, I, why, how many times in the winter time do we have fuel-related deaths? Nobody, nobody talks very much about that. Nobody talks about the, what the lack of fuel and the lack of the money. If I, the bills have gone up so much lately that I'm getting to the stage you're worrying yourself sick if it's when the next bill comes in if you're going to have enough money to pay for it. Because we were let down. The pension we get in Britain is an absolute disgrace compared to the European countries. And I, I don't think it's right at all. So when you're talking about fuel poverty, think about the people it affects, the people who can't really do much about it because they don't have enough to pay for what they need. So please, everybody, think about the old folk the people who can't, who are maybe even confined to the house, people with disabilities who are confined to the house and can't go anywhere because they can't take get there because of their disability but Thank at the end of the day if you've got a bit of money you can go anywhere or you can get somebody to take you anywhere whereas if you haven't got you're sitting like in misery they talk about loneliness in older people there's a lot of loneliness and part of that loneliness is worry and trying to keep your, your head above water on an inadequate income. Thank you Thank, Nell, you. thank you very much indeed <laughs> also uh, Th thanks also for raising the point about loneliness, which is a point that isn't often raised in these circles, but is becoming a huge political issue. Uh, and so thank you for raising that. And Susan, if you're really brief, you have a chance to put your, put your comment. Uh, I really have to go back to this help to work. Sorry, but I was on the Scottish Parliament doorstep with Willie Black and all the Job Centre Plus workers that went on strike because they were receiving counselling and fed up having to sanction people. The workers themselves can't cope with how many folk there are. So how are they going to cope asking every single person for to go in every day for an interview for to try and get them back to work? How's that going to be feasible? And I, I, I really did not get your name, the new person for the Conservatives. You, what was your name? Gordon. It's Gordon. Gordon, Gordon um, you were talking about people that are now. Where have you been since the Tories came to power? How many thousands of people have died if they've been declared fit to work? I didn't ken how you missed that. But seriously, Willie, you were right about one thing. I definitely will come and work with any party for to get what I need for my peers. For God's sake, though, somebody mayor in all the parliament seriously needs to listen. Because you are just going from bad to worse and making things even more difficult. It's just unbelievable how bad things are getting. You just didn't see it. Eh? 
Job Centre Plus for to take on every person for to get them a job. We exploited them through Panorama and BBC for to show them you could fill in a message line and go in and they took it and they put it in a thing for to say they never even checked if you had checked, done searches or anything like that. They didn't even read it, they just put it in a file. Wrong, wrong answers again, eh? Thank you very much. Uh, Susan, tell, Susan, can you just tell, tell us your name, where you're from, just for the record? <coughs> All right, Susan Archibald, the Archibald Foundation. Thank you, and a native of Fife as well. Uh, with it, yeah, John, you want to come in finally on this point? If I can just comment on one or two things that were said there. I mean, to take that one first, I mean, we need to have a simpler system. I mean, I think a number of the speakers have said that. Uh, and I mean, that's one of my main arguments for the living wage. So if people are working, they shouldn't be, if people are working, they shouldn't be needing tax credits. I mean, unless they've got a very unusual uh, situation. But if people, if the statutory minimum wage, if the living wage is what people are getting, that takes a whole lot of people out of the system. And that's money that is effectively subsidising employers. It's, it's not going to help the individual, in fact. Uh, so, so that money, that, that is one way we could easily simplify the system. I mean, I'm far from convinced that universal credit is simplifying the system. It is burying a lot of things under one figure, but I think that is going to make things very difficult for housing associations and others who are then going to try and question, is somebody getting the right benefits? Whereas at least if it's in six different headings, it, you can check each of the six headings. If they're all lost under universal credit, I don't know how that works. And I mean, just back, back to also to Frank's point, this is one of the richest countries in the world. And while I would like to grow the economy as a whole and might slightly disagree with Patrick on that point, the reality is we could stop growing the economy and share it out a lot more fairly. And that's got to be, we're not going to be able to do that on day one of independence, but hopefully over the medium to long term, eh, we can actually do that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we're, I guess I'm just going to take the final question and I will take you in once we've heard the responses. Um, so we're going to constructively edit the agenda given that we're running out of time. So if I can ask for really, really brief responses to this question and it comes from my colleague Chris Golden from GRF. Chris here, thank you. Thanks. Um, what policy of another party that would reduce poverty do you agree with? <laughs> so, isn't that a great question for a bunch of politicians? So, just to repeat Chris's question, what policy from another party that would reduce poverty do you agree with? Um, should come to uh, Gordon and Patrick because you haven't gone first previously. Gordon, I know well, it's, a, it's a killer question, <clears throat> but... Well, I'm the only uh, non-professional unpaid politician for being here today, so I think I'll let the others state what their policies are <laughs> since they're paid to do so and perhaps then be given a chance to come back in and say, well, I might just agree with that one. Happily. Okay, Patrick. Well... Uh, Jackie mentioned earlier that there are opportunities to use the procurement bill at the moment. Now, this is within the limits of current devolution. I believe, Jackie disagrees, that there's a great deal more we could do with independence, and I'm excited about those opportunities. But even within the current limited powers uh, of devolution, there is a great deal more that we could use to make sure that public money, billions of pounds of public money being spent in Scotland, by, not just by the Scottish Government, by councils, by health boards, by a whole host of different public bodies, that we're making sure that we apply social, ethical and environmental criteria to that, uh, that public money. That could create benefit for small, local, independent businesses uh, instead of you know, uh, allowing the multinationals to outcompete everything, which just sucks money out of the economy. It could in, improve things like the provision of the living wage, not just in the public sector, but in private companies that are bidding for public contracts. Uh, it could, uh, I mean, there's a whole host of different ways that we could use the power of procurement more effectively. Uh, <coughs> Labour aren't the only people who've been bringing amendments along that direction, okay. but they have led on the, the argument about the living wage in the procurement okay. bill, uh, and I'll certainly be voting for that if it comes back uh, later on during the passage of that bill. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to be tougher on the rest of you to not just give an explanation of why but just tell us what policy from another party that you would support. Let's come to Willie next. Yeah, I'm going to cheat. Um, I'm going to say um, that the SNP's ambition on childcare policy 
is something that I would strongly support, but I happen to agree with it as well, and it's something that we've pushed on. In order to give people the best ability in life, the best chance in life, we need to invest in the early years. Thank you. And uh, Jackie? Um, fuel poverty, I'll stick with, and actually yeah. it's Patrick's policy. I don't know if some of you remember, there was a budget um, a few years ago now um, that stuck in my memory where Patrick was bidding for a very timid sum of £100 million, pounds, but that would have been transformational in terms of employing people, <laughs> attacking energy efficiency, and contributing to tackling fuel poverty. We ended up getting quite a bit of it, but not all of it. You know. So, uh, in, in the midst of this fledgling Labour Green Coalition. <laughs> Come on, John. Uh, where, where's, your, where's your money going? Uh, well, can I say on procurement, there are legal restrictions in that, so it's a tricky area. There's legal advice on both sides of a number of things. But, uh, no, I'm happy to go with Patrick as well on citizens' income, which I think is one of his policies. Uh, I think we have to move to that, in, uh, if not in the short term, at least in the medium term. OK. So, Gordon... Uh, you've only heard a selection of what your <coughs> colleagues think. Do you want to plump for any of these or something else? Well, I think I'll go for the easy option because on the, uh, the child policy, the SNP, I think there's general agreement on the basic principles and who would disagree that giving children the best start in life is not a good policy? Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to come to Chris and then really briefly to one or two of you. Can I have the microphone back to Chris? Thank you. Got it, sorry. Um, th thanks for the answers. Um, I, I worry that our political system is too divisive and I don't think any party wants to see high levels of poverty. Um, but I think we need to look for areas of agreement to get the, the, the kind of system in place that, that, that leads to low levels of poverty in the UK and, and Scotland. Thank you. There was no bias in selecting Chris's question from us. It was just a brilliant question. <laughs> and I'm going to come to Angus. Um, at the back there. Tell us who you are, Angus. Uh, Angus Hardy from Scottish Community Alliance. It was just to pick up on John Mason's point uh, previous, um, that this country does have the wealth to afford a much fairer system, but currently that wealth uh, is very unevenly distributed uh, across the country. And so I'd just be interested to hear the politicians' views on whether we'd be able to use that wealth without raising taxes significantly um, particularly for those who have, have the greatest amount of that wealth and earn the, the, the greatest incomes. Okay, so uh, one sentence answers. I'm going to start with the two guys who haven't uh, had their bonus ball, as it were. Uh, you get a chance to go first on this. So Angus's point about fair distribution of wealth and, and what does it mean for taxation? Yeah, I mean, for, for me as a, as a Liberal, the, the root... Um, out of many of the challenges that we face on poverty is through education. Um, if we can give people the tools, the talent, the ability to be able to achieve more in their life, I think they themselves can lift themselves out of poverty. That, to me, is the long-term solution for much of this. Now, that doesn't necessarily involve increasing taxation. It's not something that I would advocate. Um, so it's almost turning the issue on its head. It's giving people the ability to lift themselves out of poverty is the answer, the long-term answer to this. OK, Gordon. The point that was made, I think, about the question of um, too much of an adversarial approach, I think we need in this country to learn to try to work together in spite of political differences to make things work better for all of us. And uh, that's something we see again on the continent. In countries there, for example, in Germany, they've had no legal minimum wage. They may do shortly. But in fact, they had, as a matter of fact, minimum wages because the workers, trade unions, local employers, politicians would simply sit down, talk through and decide what was a fair wage for a particular uh, job. And that would be agreed and it would be paid, but there was no law saying it had to be done. So it's not just the politicians here or the government that we have to look to, but I think as a society, we have to look at the way we do things and say we can do things and you can do things without the politicians necessarily being the ones to initiate it. And uh, John, the question was directed to you partly, but John and Patrick, you're, you're both the people on the panel who support independence. Um, so 
What do you think it would mean if you cast your minds forward to get fairness and social justice and environmental justice? Are we looking at a significantly different type of tax system as well as other things? Which one of us first? Either of you. Well, well, well I mean, if, as if, long as you're brief. If, if we do vote for independence, uh, I, I think there are more <laughs> opportunities than risks. But one of the risks that I think we should be honest about is the need for government to grow the capacity to do things like design a new tax system. If we end up buying out, buying in that expertise from the likes of KPMG, we're going to end up with an even more complex system with even more loopholes for rich individuals and businesses to worm their way through. So that's a, a real danger. And I will be opposed to the SNP's plan to give corporate tax giveaways through even more cuts to corporation tax. I'll want a fairer tax system. But if we want, unlike Gordon or Winston Churchill, I don't just want a safety net and a ladder to climb. I want to close the gap between rich and poor. I want a more equal society. All the evidence shows that's what makes societies not just fairer, but healthier, stronger, safer, more resilient. Uh, I think we, we do need to be willing to talk about a fairer tax system and that. Underneath it all, though, we also need to talk about something cultural about the, the values in our society. And I want to end on this because I think it's really quite a positive note to end on. I think we are beginning as a society <laughs> to move away from the obsessive pursuit of vast amounts of wealth, the kind of rags to riches story. Uh, I think it is beginning, not ending, but it is beginning to be replaced uh, by a story that's about quality of life, uh, that's about human dignity. And most people do not obsess over becoming vastly wealthy. They want enough to pay the bills, enough to have a dignified life. But I think we need to reinforce that shift. We need to reinforce a cultural change away from the fetishization of vast wealth uh, and towards the aspiration of quality of life. And I think that that shift is beginning to happen. Thank you. John? Yeah, I mean, I probably risk going a little bit beyond party policy here, but um, the specific question is about wealth and uh, can we use that wealth? And, you know, I would have to say I think some of that wealth has been accumulated wrongly. Uh, maybe some people have done it in a decent way, I don't know. Um, but, I mean, I find it very hard to see how we can redistribute wealth without taxation. So, um, I mean, there is no commitment in the white paper that I've seen uh, that if we're independent, we're going to raise inheritance tax or capital transfer tax or any of these things. But I think they certainly have to be looked at because I find it very hard to see how we can redistribute real wealth and ownership in this country without doing things like that. And I mean, the concept of Jubilee has become quite popular in the, in the idea of cancelling debts every so often, but the original concept of Jubilee also includes redistributing wealth every 50 years. Thank you very much. And Jackie, finally, we've heard about if yes, so if no, what's your response to Angus's point? Can I say I don't doubt John's sincerity, but that isn't his party's policy, and we need to be very clear um, about what his party's policy is, because I, I believe in the redistribution of wealth. You only need to look at Scotland, never even never mind the rest of the UK, to know that in the northeast of Scotland, round about Aberdeen, there's virtually full employment, house prices are high, there is a booming economy there, yet you, know, you travel however many miles it is, 50 miles or whatever, down the road to Dundee, and it's exactly the opposite. We have not got good at making sure that all of Scotland benefits and there is much work to be done in there that actually isn't just about taxation, it's about thinking about the labour market and where people need to be um, and you know, what opportunities they can tap into. But I cannot imagine a future where you have a tax cutting government corporation tax, air passenger duty, you know, I could give you a list of them that they're planning to tax that fits with Patrick's idea, which I sign up to, which is of this more equal society where we're closing the gap. Because what we're doing is we're having, if you like, US-style taxation, but we want Scandinavian welfare, and the two just don't add up. And frankly, okay. people need to do the sums about that. In terms of what we would really, do, really briefly. very briefly... We have actually said that we would put in place a 50% taxation rate to redistribute some of that wealth across the UK, and our devolution commission has said that in Scotland too. I don't think anybody, perhaps with the exception of Patrick, has signed up to anything like that. You and okay. I will have such good debates from September we will. the 19th onwards. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, please thank our panel this morning. Uh,